One problem is that the language that people use when they're trying to describe their inventions is not the language that I as a scientist am used to, and so I have to translate it, if you like, into a way that I can begin to understand what they're trying to say. It might as well be written in Swahili for all of the sense that it initially makes. And so I'm not particularly inspired to put a lot more effort in in the hope that the pearl of wisdom will reveal itself to me. At a certain point, you hit a law of diminishing returns. It isn't just a question of the difficulties of communication. There is a profound barrier between scientists and inventors, and a strong reluctance on the part of most scientists to risk their reputations grappling with issues that don't have a clear scientific pedigree. Reluctance to look foolish inhibits a lot of people from looking at things. This is looked at as a pariah. You get, you touch it and it, it creates an image of you that you don't want your colleagues to see. One extreme, you might have things that are guaranteed to work, but are not very interesting if they do. And at the other extreme, things that are a real long shot, but would be revolutionary. And so you have to try and weigh the balance and decide which side is more likely to be profitable for you. Then having made some choices, you then have to ask yourself, well, how do I actually go about doing this? Do I have to apply for funds to do it? And if I do, who will I be competing with? And what is the better chance that this will be supported or that? Because, at least in the big science area that I work, you can't just sort of come up with an idea on a Friday and expect to start the experiment on a Saturday. It takes many months, many years even, of preparation. But though the scientific establishment may have ignored the likes of Meyer, the powerful military industrial complex certainly hasn't. Over the past ten years, Meyer says he's been quietly approached by many influential organizations who would never admit publicly to their involvement with him. It is involved in deep space exploration, and it's also uh, being developed uh, quite highly in the military. Basically, what occurred with water fuel cell was in the fact that once they understood uh, was actually occurring, then under the U.S. national security uh, mandate, uh, I have no decision or power of whether or not the military or NASA or the federal government will utilize the technology. They can utilize it in any way they so desire. NASA is using every method it can to regain some of its now fading glory. In the face of strong congressional resistance, the days of limitless budgets for space exploration have long since gone. As the champion of a new, environmentally friendly energy source, NASA would gain immense support. Your identification, please. You have your identification? As a former top scientist of the NASA space plane project, Professor Paul Ziss has an inside track on the workings of the agency. NASA has large centers. The center that's in charge of propulsion is NASA Lewis in Cleveland, Ohio. Can you imagine, instead of having a, um, a million pound rocket has 900,000 pounds of fuel on board, an oxidizer, can you imagine what it would be like if you could put a device on there that would split water and run it into your engines? No explosive compounds. Public confirmation of a contract from NASA would provide a resounding boost for Mars technology. But Paul Ziss says it's only in a closed meeting they confirm such an agreement. They're looking for new energy sources. I understand from the people that I've talked with that they have worked with Stan and trying to understand what he's done and given him a contract. I also understand with the bureaucracy in Washington and the con congressional oversight as to why they would never admit it. Anyone that does that will be suspect, will be challenged, will be considered a threat. But if only a fraction of what Meyer claims for his technology can be achieved, it would represent a vindication for NASA's involvement. It would also be a powerful threat to many entrenched vested interests. If Stan Meyer's device works like he advertises, you would make energy available universally almost free. That is a major, major, major impact. When new technology comes in existence, there's a great uh, resistance to it uh, because it can affect a lot of economic factors. Uh, in this particular case in the United States, um, 
we pay out roughly about $200 uh, billion dollars a year for foreign oil. Uh, it's quite obvious that uh, the Arabs would pay $200 billion dollars to try to keep this type of technology uh, out of the economy. And many, many times over the last decade, uh, I have been offered enormous amounts of money to simply sell out or to sit on it. The Arabs offered me well over a billion dollars cold cash simply to sit on and do absolutely nothing with it. My life has been uh, threatened uh, many times. Uh, of course, I happen to believe in the power of angels. And if I don't believe in the power of angels, I don't believe I'll be around here too long. If the thing like Stan Mayer has works, every piston engine, every gas turbine in the world today, if it had its converter, could run on it. Uh, with a little invention, we could get standalone devices to run all over the world. Um, I think it would be inc what I would can be concerned about is the people that sell energy would be essentially bankrupted. It's what happened to the Conestoga wagons when trains came, or to the Pony Express when the telegraph came in. They're going to wipe out an entrenched power base, and they may not go easily.